Okay, let's open our Bible to Genesis 14. Genesis chapter 14. Don't forget, next week, next Wednesday is our nursing home service. And um, we would love to have you come. You will be blessed by it, I guarantee. Well, huh? Yeah, if you can be there by six, what we're going to try is a different system this week so we could get more of the residents in the room. Um, and uh, we've got some folks working with us on that. Um, but uh, it's the, the actual doings, I guess, starts at 6.30, right? Yeah. And, Yeah. And let me give you another little update, and I think it's, I believe it's a real praise. Um, last year, uh, Willie came to me, and um, his son Tracy, and they're involved in tractor pulling. And uh, they have a club or an organization down here at the, uh, at the uh, fairgrounds or at the farm museum. And he said, uh, they want somebody from the church to come to the dinner um, because they want to donate some money to buy coats for kids. And um, I, I don't know for what reason, but God's just put this coat thing on my heart. And so I went down and, and, uh, and they had a great, uh, they used, I think the last pull of the year, they donate the proceeds. But anyway, long story short, they gave me a, they gave me a thousand dollars for coats. And um, so we have bought coats with that. I went back this year here just a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago for this year's dinner. They gave me $635, but uh, we got an emergency kind of request um, first of the week and uh, we've got those coats. And But all told with what they bought and what we bought, I think we're close to 150 coats that we bought kids this year. And um, I just praise the Lord for that and I praise God for the opportunity um, to do that. And y'all pray for me because you are looking at the official new Coats for Kid chairman in Mason County. <laughs> Brother, Brother Jim Kelly is retiring. Thank you. No, no, no applause, just throw money and we'll buy coats. So. But uh, Brother Jim Kelly down at Trinity is gonna retire and, uh, in 2019, and he's been taking that up since Pastor Sargent left, and so I have volunteered. I think he about had a heart attack. Somebody actually volunteered to do something, but I volunteered to do that, so, uh, but I don't know, just, I, that's on my heart for these kids, and, and uh, uh, so I just wanted to share that with you. I thought that was great news. Uh, Genesis 14, I want you to look with me at verse uh, 14. And when Abraham his brother, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them. Now, what's happened here is that a bunch of kings have come along. A guy named Cheater Lomor, yeah, say that 10 times fast. Don't name any of your kids after that guy. But a bunch of these kings have come and they have raided Sodom, Gomorrah, and a couple of other cities and they have and taken the people captive and taken all their goods. And one of the people that was taken captive or some of the people was Lot. Lot was living in Sodom. That's Abraham's nephew. It calls him his brother here, but his, his brother's son. And so the word comes that this has happened and Abraham gets his servants and he goes after him. So that's what's happening here. And he divided himself against them, verse 15. He and his servants by night and smote them and pursued them into Hoba, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And when he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people, 
And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedor Loamer and the kings that were with him at the valley of Shaveh, which is the king's dale. And this is the verse that I want you to see. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which, delivered, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he, that is Abraham, gave him, Melchizedek, tithes of all. Um, the reason I read that story is because that's basically all we know about Melchizedek. That's it. Um, and the reason he's significant is because if you go over to Hebrews chapter 7, uh, where we're going to spend a few minutes tonight, Hebrews chapter 7, it talks about Jesus Christ as our great high priest, but he is the great high priest not after the order of Levi or Aaron, but after the order of Melchizedek. And you say, so what? What's the big deal about that? Well, remember, so much of what we have taught and looked at about the tabernacle has been typical. It was pointing to the fulfillment of the, in the New Testament through the life and the ministry and the sacrifice and the person of Jesus Christ. The sacrifices, the priesthood. But the priesthood is going to be different. And we're going to show you tonight why it's different and why it's better. Okay? So, if we go back over to Hebrews chapter 7, uh, we're going to read the first uh, few verses here about Melchizedek, because the writer to the Hebrews takes this basically unknown figure, and he tells us some important things about him. It says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom... <laughs> Excuse me, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. He is without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually." Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. Now I want to start with the Levitical priesthood uh, because there's a few facts that we need to remember about them so that we can compare them with what Abraham or what uh, Jesus is through Melchizedek. First of all, the care of the tabern tabernacle and the priesthood all came through the Levites. That was their job. Not all Levites were priests, only the ones who were the tribe of Aaron uh, or descendants of Aaron were priests, but the rest of them had a job to do to take care of the, of the tabernacle. And that was either setting it up or caring for it or packing it or moving it and uh, so forth. So they were all Jewish. That's important. All Jewish. A Gentile could not be a priest, could not handle the tabernacle, couldn't move it, work in it. Secondly, the Levites were subject to the king. When they did finally get a king, remember, we, we want a king like the other nations, and they finally got a king. The Levites were not royals. That is, that they had no royal powers. They were subject just like everybody else. Even though they had a unique position in the economy of Israel, they were just citizens. They were not royalty. So they had to do whatever the king said, just like anybody else. Number three, the sacrifices made by the priest were only temporary, not permanent. They provided no permanent solution for sin. A person would bring their offering, they would offer it, they could be absolved from their sin, and it only lasted until they sinned again. And then they had to do it again, and then again. And then again, and for hundreds of years, this, the Levitical priesthood offered these sacrifices over and over and over and over and over because they had no permanent uh, remedy for sin. 
Number four, the Levitical priesthood was hereditary. It started with Aaron, Aaron's sons, and then his sons after him, and then his uncles, and everybody under Aaron could be a priest. It was all due not to their goodness, not to their morality, not to their good life. It was all due to their pedigree, if you will, um, and their, because they belonged to the right family. And then number five, a priest's service was temporary. A priest would start serving in the tabernacle or in the temple later at the age of 25. They would serve till they were 50, and then they would retire. Man, I wish we had that retirement plan here. <laughs> um, and if you want a verse to look that up, it's Numbers 8, 24, and 25. So those are five things that we have to keep in mind about the Levitical priesthood. Now, let's take that and move it over to Melchizedek and, and uh, why God chose him. The thing that I want you to see about Melchizedek, and this is so important, everything that a t- is a type in the Old Testament is not a perfect type because it's a human being. And it isn't said that, doesn't say that Jesus is like Melchizedek. It says Melchizedek reflects the kind of priesthood that Jesus had. And so Melchizedek is reflecting on Christ, and Jesus is an order of the, of the priesthood like him, or in, in, in things. Anyway, you got it. First of all, his priesthood was universal, it was not national. In relation to Israel, what was the name of God that was so sacred to the Jews? Anybody know? What is the name that they couldn't even write? With it? What? Yahweh. Yahweh. Um, there's no vowels in Hebrew, so we don't really know how it's pronounced, but um, we, we pronounce it Jehovah today. Um, but it was the most sacred name. It was the covenant name for God. And that covenant was with with God and with his people. Now, I want you to notice here in verse, um, uh, let's see, here, verse 1, it says, concerning Melchizedek, that he was the king of Salem, the priest of what? The most high God. The name here is a name that um, is the name called El Elyon. E-L-Y-O-N. It is a more universal name for God than the specific name Jehovah, which is basically a covenant name for God, the Jews, God. So what we're saying here is his, his priesthood was not national. His priesthood was not just for Jews. He wasn't the Messiah of the Jews only. He was the Messiah of the world, right? So that was one of the things that made his priesthood different than the Levitical priest. They could only, the, the Levites could only minister to the Jews, and Jesus, of course, represents the whole world. Secondly, Melchizedek's priesthood was royal. Remember, the Levites couldn't serve. Uh, they weren't royalty. They had to be subject to the king. And he says he is the king of Salem. Do you know what the word Salem means? How about if I said Shalom? Shalom. It means peace. He is the king of peace. Do you know where Salem is located? It's, how about Jerusalem? He is the king of Jerusalem. He was also called Salem, the king of peace. He is also said he is the um, king of righteousness. He was a royal person. He was not just a priest, but he was also a king. Hmm, doesn't that sound like somebody we know? It sounds just like Jesus, doesn't it? Levitical priest couldn't be king. But being a priest after the order of Melchizedek pictures the dual role of Jesus Christ. He is Savior and Lord. He is our priest and our king. Um, if you'll hold your spot here and Joe, go back in the Old Testament to Psalm 110. 
1,000 years after the events of Genesis 14, we have heard for that 1,000 years nothing about Melchizedek. All we have is that little incident there in Genesis 14. Genesis 110, I mean Psalm 110. Who wrote it? What's it say in your Bible? The Psalm of? A Psalm of David. It says in verse 1, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at the right hand until I make thine enemies my footstool. And he, the Lord shall send the rod of the strength out of Zion. Rule thou in midst of thy, yeah, in thine enemies. The, thy people shall be willing in the days of thy power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a what? A priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So somehow, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, David the king understood and saw back a thousand years to that incident in the life of Abraham and saw that this was going to point towards the Messiah. The Messiah would not just be a priest, he would also be a king. And this is true of, of Melchizedek. Thirdly, Melchizedek's priesthood was righteousness and peace. Under the Old Testament economy, there was no permanent righteousness. We mentioned that. Every time a sin occurred, they had to offer another sacrifice. Even for the priest, the priest had to offer for himself. Did anybody ever have permanent peace? Did they? In the Old Testament? No, they couldn't. Why? Because as soon as they sinned, they lost their peace. They had to go back and do it again, and again, and again. There was no permanent righteousness, and there was no permanent peace. But under Melchizedek, he says to us, back over in Hebrews, he says that this king will bring righteousness, and he is not only the king of righteousness, but he is also the king of Salem, which is peace, which is the king of peace. So Jesus Christ, in his work on the cross, produced for us not only peace, but also righteousness. What the blood of the bulls and goats could not do, the blood of Jesus Christ did. Um, all right, number four. The Melchizedekian priesthood was personal not hereditary. For to be a Le Levitical priest, you, you had to get your, your uh, genealogy out and get on genealogy.com and, uh, and, and list your heirs. Personal qualifications meant nothing. You could be a lousy guy, but if you were in the line, and I think I shared this with you before, but when I was in Israel, I asked the uh, gal at, in Jerusalem at the institute there, I said, well, how are you pulling out priests? Because the genealogies were destroyed back in AD 70 when Titus destroyed uh, Jerusalem and the temple. I said, you have to have a genealogy to, to become prove that you can be a priest and you're of the, lit, the, of the line of Aaron. How can you do that if you've got priests now? She said, oh, it's easy. And I said, easy? She said, yep, if your name is Cohen, you're a priest. Well, we just happened to go to church with a couple, and his last name was Cohen. And so, and his first name was wonderful, it was Mel. And I told him when I got to church that Sunday, I said, hey there, brother priest. And he looked at me funny. I said, you're a Jewish priest, you just don't know it. You're a Baptist, but you're a Jewish priest, because his name was Cohen. And it was a, huh? They, they may have a record, but the problem is the record that counted was what was in the temple. That was where the, all the lineage and the genealogies were kept. And when the, the temple was destroyed, those official records, now a family member like, you, you know, we, we've got a family, a, a family Bible and we've got, you know, who was, grandma was married to and all that kind of stuff. But, but for the Jews, the, the record that mattered was what was in the temple. 
That's the reason they had such a problem after the destruction of the temple was because nobody could prove their lineage after that. And you had to be able to prove your lineage if you wanted to be a priest. It didn't matter what kind of life you lived. But when you come to Christ, that's a different story. Um, Now, here's here's an interesting thing about Christ. Melchizedek had no genealogy. What does it say about him? He says, he said, he is without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now, did Melchizedek have a beginning? Sure he did. Now, some people say that he was a pre-incarnate uh, 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 manifestation of Jesus Christ. I don't believe that. I believe he was a man. But here's the key to it. It uses the silence about Melchizedek and his origin and his ultimate end. It uses that silence as a picture of the fact of Jesus Christ. Wait a minute, you say, Jesus Christ, he has a genealogy. Yes, he does. Why does he need a genealogy? Luke, Matthew, both of them give a genealogy of Christ. Why does he need a genealogy? Does he need it to be the high priest? Think carefully before you answer. He does not need it to be the high priest. Because after the order of Melchizedek, there is no genealogy. Why does he need a genealogy? To be what? Who? Son Son of David. To sit on David's throne, he has to be able to trace his lineage back to David. So he needs the genealogy to be the king, but he doesn't need a genealogy to be the priest because he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek, and Melchizedek has no genealogy. By the way, he couldn't have been a priest, a Levitical priest. Could he? Could he have been a Levitical priest? Why not? What tribe was he from? He wasn't a Levite. He was what? From what tribe? He was the lion of the tribe of Judah. So, under the Jewish law, he couldn't have been a priest either anyway. That's why God created a new one that just for him. Number five, Melchizedek's priesthood is eternal, not temporary. When did the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood start? Well, it started with Aaron, and it started in the wilderness when God gave them the plans for the tabernacle, and they needed a priest to run the thing. When did it end? I told you last week, see who was listening. There's a test. It ended in A.D. 70 when Titus destroyed the temple, and there was no more place to offer sacrifices, and the priesthood was done. There was no more priesthood, and there hasn't been any priest since then. But Jesus Christ, how long does his priesthood last? Forever. He abrideth a a priest continually, it says here. Um, Look down in verse 25 or 24 of that chapter. And there's a whole lot here more, but I'm just touching on this. But this man, talking about Jesus, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. So what does that mean? Wherefore he is able also to save them to the, what's the next word? Uttermost that come unto God by him. How can he save us to the uttermost? Because he ever liveth to make intercession for us. He never dies. He's living forever. His priesthood never is over. He's always interceding on our behalf. He is our advocate. He is our satisfaction. He is our propitiation. He is the the one that stands before the throne and says, wait a minute, yeah, I know what you're saying about Mel, but that's under the blood. That's under the blood. I don't know about you, but that's good stuff. That's good stuff. So, those are just some things about Melchizedek's priesthood and why 
Jesus is, is referred to. He's not saying that Melchizedek was a perfect person or anything else, but he uses this mysterious man in one incident, one few verses in the Bible, but he uses it for a purpose. Now, here's, here's something that I want else I want you to see, and this is, this is a little bit unrelated, but I think it's interesting. We have the book of Genesis. Mel mentions Melchizedek. We have the book of Psalms that mentions Melchizedek. And we have the book of Hebrews. You know what that tells me? That tells me that God wrote the whole book. That he's the author. It all works together. I don't know about you, but I'm glad for that too. Because I can depend on everything that's in that book. It's all tied together. Anyone have a question about this? About Melchizedek or anything we've studied so far? I've got a couple of questions that somebody asked last week, and I'm going to deal with those real quickly. If you don't have a question, uh, I'll be glad to take your question and save these if you have something. Here's a question. Open your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The question is, when a person dies, does their soul go directly to heaven? I always hear people say they are in heaven, now looking down on us, or they are with Jesus now. I'm confused, because in the Bible it says that the dead shall rise again. How do they rise if they are already in heaven? Very good question. Every person in this room tonight is made up of three parts. Okay? We are triune beings. We are made in the image of God. Not in the physical image, but we are made in the spiritual image of God. God is the three part, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are a triune being. We have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. Okay? The body is how we relate to the visible world. The, spirit, the soul is how we we're intellectual and mind, will, and emotions. And then the spirit is how we relate to God. Death, and this is really important. So many people don't understand this. Death is not termination. Kelly, tonight, is alive and well. Death is separation. When a believer dies... The body goes, we bury it, whatever we do with it. But as soon as they die, their spirit goes to be with God. That's why I wanted you to talk, look at this in verse, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6. He says, therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Okay? For we walk by, here it is, faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be what? Present with the Lord. So what happens is, and the answer to the question is, when a believer dies, we take care of the body. We do something with it. We bury it. We cremate it, whatever you do. But as soon as that person dies that's a believer, they're with the Lord. Their spirit is with God. Then one day, praise the Lord, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to resurrect that body, 1 Corinthians 15. And he's going to make it a new body and he's going to put the spirit and the body back together and then we'll always be with the Lord. And that's our hope. So how can they be in heaven looking down on us and their, and, and their body be in the grave? Is because the reality, and I, when I preach this, the preach funerals, I'll often do that when I stand by a casket and I'll say, look, this is not your loved one. This is the house they used to live in. I said, but they are with God if they're believers. And one day God's going to put the house and the believer back together and make it new. So that's how they can be in heaven and at the same time their body can be out at the cemetery. And God's going to bring it all and then there will be no more death, right? No more separation. That's our hope. Okay, one more question here. This is a good question, especially this time of year. Open your Bibles to Luke, to Luke 2. Luke 
Luke chapter 2. Do, do you think that baby Jesus had the entire knowledge of God as he lay a newborn? Was he able to understand who Jesus was to the world? Or did knowledge and wisdom increase with physical and mental maturity? So laying there in that little baby, could he, you know, turn water into wine if he wanted to? Well, the answer is in Luke chapter 2. If you look in verse 40, it says this about Jesus. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. He grew up just like any other kid. You say, well, wait a minute. Did he know everything? Well, you have to go down to verse 52. This is after the visit in the temple, after he's about 12 years old. It says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. I believe he learned just like a child and uh, matured just like a child. Um, I know there are interesting, and I wasn't even aware of this until a few years back, but there are fables that said Jesus as a child would entertain the other children by taking up a, a piece of clay and turning it into a bird. Oh yeah, that's real good use of God's powers, you know. Um, but, you know, those liberals have to do something. I don't know. <laughs> I heard one of the preachers say that when he was a child, uh, one of the preachers told him that he could have the Holy Spirit and he could have mm-hmm. Well, that's probably in the margin someplace or something. I don't know. Well, of course. Yeah. It's like what I say about some preachers I've heard. It makes great preaching, but poor theology. Uh, Poor Bible interpretation. Um, Jesus Christ did not enter his physical ministry, his ministry on this earth, until he was an adult. Um, And that time, before that time, I believe he lived just like any other Jewish man. He worked in his father's uh, shop. He learned carpentry. He went to temple, went to synagogue. He worshiped, he learned, he studied and um, you know, it, there wasn't any glow around his head and all that kind of stuff. Yes. Yes. No. No, he did not have a sin nature. No. That was the only, that was one of the things, and I, I've thought about this often, having been a parent, and if, if you're parents, you'll understand. How in the world do you raise a perfect kid? I mean, really? They never said anything wrong. They never do anything wrong. <clears throat> but no, he did not sin. He couldn't sin. That was our discussion last week. <laughs> okay, question, anybody comment? Yeah, brother. Well, the other thing is you have to remember that at the age of 12, when they took him to Jerusalem, where did they find him? What was he doing when they couldn't find him? He, he was talking with the leaders, the spiritual leaders, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, and the teachers of the law. And he was confounding them with his wisdom. I don't want you to think that, you know, him, he was some dumb little kid. I mean, he was very wise. And even when they said, listen, we got to go, he said, I got to be about my father's business. But he had to learn obedience as a son. And so he, he, he knew a lot of things, but it wasn't time. And how many times did you know, they try to lay hands on Jesus? It's ain't time. So he, he, he was under submission. We've talked about this so many times. Or I've talked about it so many times. Being under submission, under submission, under submission. That's the place of protection. That's the place where God can use us, direct us, and bless us under 
to submission. He was under the submission of his father, Heavenly Father. When his father said, go, it's time. He was ready because he learned obedience under that submission. <clears throat> sure. Sure he was. And see, we, as far as we can tell, Joseph was dead, had died by the time that Jesus was crucified because he was nowhere in the picture, even during his earthly ministry and uh, with the other uh, women following around and helping to support what he did. Um, th there was no sign of Joseph, so he was taking care of his mother because what did he say to John? He said, son, behold thy mother, mother, behold thy son. Okay, any questions? I got a couple more questions here that last week, and we'll deal with those as we uh, go forward. And, and, uh, but great questions, and I appreciate you asking those. And, and if you have one, please don't hesitate to just write it down. I don't need a name. Just uh, put it down on a card or just hand it to me or put it in the offering plate, and we'll be glad to deal with those for you. Okay, let's stand up. We'll be dismissed in prayer. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, thank you for answering these questions for us. They're not silly questions, they're important because it helps us to understand who you are. It helps us to understand your plan, your program, and your program has been from everlasting to everlasting. It isn't a program just in time, even though all we see is what's in front of us right now at this particular slice of time, but your program is from ever forever. And you see it all at once. And you're working all things together for your glory. And I just thank you for helping us to see some of these things through the tabernacle and, and letting us see that it was more than just a tent and it was more than just some animals being killed and it was more than just some guys uh, serving you. Uh, it was a picture of your plan, and it was a picture of your person and your son, Jesus Christ, as our high priest that, that intercedes on our behalf. He is the mediator of your new covenant. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement it is to my heart, and I pray to the, your people's heart. Bless us now as we go in Jesus' name. Amen.